Uh, everything there is uh, looking good, so I'm happy for that. So uh, let's dive right into our prophetic word for today. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Father, for giving us uh, for it in Jesus name amen all right amen and amen so oh man was that dropping that shouldn't be dropping already uh, that shouldn't be dropping at all okay but anyway so we're going to dive right into our uh, broadcast for today <clears throat> today's prophetic word is new grace new grace today's prophetic word is new grace Grace. Now, our scripture reference is very familiar. Ephesians chapter 2, verses uh, 8 through 10. But hopefully you're going to get something out of it you never heard before. Okay, so let's jump right in. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, now let me start off right off the bat by saying something controversial. Um, I know that people, and when I, when I say people, I mean a lot of Christians are still arguing about eternal security. They're still arguing about uh, are you saved, like once you saved, are you always saved, or can you lose your salvation and go to hell? So it's like, can you be a Christian, but then can you do something that messes you up and kicks you out of the kingdom, and then you end up going to hell. And the answer to that question is, absolutely. Being born again is just like coming out of your mother's womb. Just like when you come out of your mother's womb physically, you, you can't make your parents not be who they are. Once you come out of the womb of the church or New Jerusalem, which is our Heavenly Mother, spiritually, you can't make Father God not be your father. His DNA is all in your spirit now. And then when you get filled with the Holy Ghost and you get the seal of the Holy Spirit. So once you become born again, once you say you are. kingdom of God. Uh, sorry, I think my video just started on Facebook, so I'll repeat what I said. Once you are saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. Okay? Just like when you come out your mother's womb, when they take a DNA test, you can't make your parents not be your parents. The long oh. You can't make God not be your father. You can't make Jesus not be your savior. Once you become born again, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. So what a lot of people do is they misinterpret the scriptures. They don't understand that the kingdom of God is a hierarchy. The kingdom of God has levels. That's what a lot of people don't understand. And a lot of the scriptures that people think mean you can lose your salvation and go to hell actually mean that you will miss out on all the victory God meant for you to have in this life and all the reward that God meant, God meant for you to have in the next life. Okay? Because you could be saved and still miss God. Because God is someone that you have to get to know. He's a person. He's not a set of rules. You hear me say that all the time. And you can be saved and still miss God. Okay? How do I know that's true? Because the Lord said a lot of people are going to say to him, Lord, Lord. And he said everybody that says that is not going to enter the kingdom. Because they spent their whole life doing a bunch of what they thought was good works. And then in the final judgment, the Lord says, get out of my face because I never knew you. We never had a relationship. So when the Bible's talking about going into outer darkness, it's not talking about hell, okay? Because there's several words for hell in the scripture. There's the actual word hell, which doesn't, the English word hell, which doesn't appear in the Bible. There's Gehenna, there's Shehal, and there's Tartarus. Okay, Tartarus only happens one time, 
1 Peter 3, 6, Tartarus is where the fallen angels go. Okay, that's their particular hell. But Sheol is where the is the realm of the undead, where human spirits go. And then Gehenna was actually a Greek flip on a Hebrew word that it meant garbage dump. It meant a garbage dump that was on fire. But the English word hell, as we understand it, is not actually in the scripture. It's an English translation. And again, it's Tartarus, Gehenna, and Sheol. Okay, and Tartarus is only in the Bible one time. So when the Bible is talking about outer darkness, it means a place of less glory. It means that Jesus is all the way at the top. And people that serve God faithfully their whole lives get to sit in Jesus' throne with him. But people that are Christians but don't serve the Lord like they should are going to be in a place of lower glory. That's what that's talking about. It's not talking about hell. Because nowhere where, Lord, where the Lord says that does he mention Sheol, Gehenna, or Tartarus. Okay? So it's not talking about you losing your salvation and going to hell. Because once you save, you always save. You can't lose your salvation. But you can lose your reward. You can lose your reward in this life. And you can lose your reward in the next life. Because your salvation is based solely on the word, uh, excuse me, solely on the work of Christ. It's based solely on what Jesus did at the cross is based solely on the finished work of Christ. And the Lord took all of the punishment for all of your sins, past, present, and future, on the cross of Calvary. That's why Jesus' death was so brutal. That's why it was so ugly, because he was paying, and according to Romans 8, if you read Romans chapter 8, the Lord was actually becoming sin. He wasn't just paying for sin. He was actually becoming the sins that we commit. The Lord became that on the cross and took the full wrath, the full punishment, the full penalty of God in his body and paid for sin once and for all. That's why Jesus, when he got through dying, said it was finished. That's why the veil in the temple was rent in two. And that's why we can call God, uh, Father God now, Abba Father or Daddy. We can say our Father. The Lord said, I ascend to my Father and your Father. Why? The Lord only had to die one time because he only paid one time for sin for all time. Okay? So once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, once you're saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. And I know a whole lot of people teach otherwise that there's something you could do to go to hell. There is nothing you could do to save yourself. There is nothing you could do to keep yourself. That's all the work of Christ on the cross. Okay? <coughs> Where the confusion comes in, is how we live our daily lives. And what, what a lot of Christians don't understand is you have to live your life by daily grace. Just like God gave you grace according to the scriptures I read in the ages, uh, in the ages well, that's verse 7, ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now that ought to tell you God's attitude. In the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Why would God be desiring to show us kindness if he's trying to catch us in some sin and send us back to hell? That's religious people. That's religious people that don't understand the power of the blood of Jesus or mercy or forgiveness. And religious people always say, well, if you teach people that, they think that means that's a license to sin. That's incorrect. That means you don't know the love of God because God's love is so beautiful. God's love is so powerful. God loves me whether I serve him or not. Romans 5.8. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means God loves us separate from our behavior. God's love is not based on how we act. He loved us while we were sinners. Think about that. God's love is not based on how we act. You think about people. People's love is based on how you act. God's love is not based on how you act. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? God's love is truly without condition. And then his grace is a free gift paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross, not by anything you did. As it says in verse 9, Ephesians 2 and 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. So your salvation is bought and paid for, and it was finished at the cross of Christ. But that's getting you in the kingdom. That's getting you reattached to Father God through Jesus Christ. That's making you be born again. That's making you be a child of God. Once you get in the kingdom, you have to grow spiritually the same way you grow naturally. It takes you 13 years to be 13 years old, and you're just starting to be a young adult. It takes you 21 years to be 21 years old, 
and you still ain't got no sense. What's the age of sense? 40. <laughs> it takes you four decades just to get some sense. So just as we grow mentally and just as we grow physically, our spiritual growth is the same way. It's not automatic, but what I mean by that is you have to feed that inner man. You have to feed your newly created self. You have to feed yourself in the kingdom of God. And that's the difference between Christians. Some Christians are growing and some Christians are not. If you have a lot of kids, you might be closer to some kids than others. It doesn't mean that the kids you're not closest to are not your kids. That's what religious people keep saying. That, that, that Christians that are still carnal or Christians that haven't grown or Christians that haven't learned how to crucify their flesh are not really saved. That is not true. It means you have to grow. It means you have to grow in Christ. Okay? Just like you grew physically, it takes you 13 years to be 13. Okay? The Bible says in Luke 2.22 that Jesus grew. So when God became a man, he grew just like we do. He grew spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, in favor with God and man. See what I mean? And so that is why so many people get confused. They don't understand the salvation work of Christ versus the sanctification work of Christ. When you accept Jesus as Savior, you only have to do that one time. Because everything about being born again was paid for on the cross. You get saved, you accept Jesus as Savior. But the challenge, Romans 12, 1, is to accept him as Lord. And to accept Jesus as Lord means you take your hands off of the controls of your life. You say, not my will, but thy will. Ask God for, the devil's really fighting this message because my face will keep going in and out. That's how I know what's coming forth is the truth. Um, uh, so you take your hands off and you say, Jesus, take the will. Learning how to make Jesus be the Lord of your life is every day for the rest of your life. It's something you're going to have to work on. You're going to have to crucify that flesh every day. You're going to have to deny self every day. You're going to have to say, not my will and thy be done every day. And you're not going to do it perfectly. Even people that have been walking with God for years don't do it perfectly. Moses made a mistake. The last great act of Moses' life was losing his temper. And God told him to speak to the rock. But Moses went out there and struck the rock. Okay, King David was not a young man when he saw Bathsheba and got caught up in an adulterous and then eventually murderous affair. Okay, so Samson, Samson uh, served God, Samson was anointed, Samson was a judge, but Samson loved strange women, he loved Philistine women, and Samson had a lot of girlfriends and prostitutes. And eventually, his love for fornication killed him. Took him out here early listening to Delilah and got himself sold into the hands of the enemies. So... You're not, Job, God was in heaven bragging on Job because Job's morals and ethics are, are so, were so strong. He was bragging on him. But Job still just had a religious relationship with God. He says at the end of Job, I heard of you, God, but now I see you with my eye and I repent in dust and ashes. In other words, Job understood, I really didn't know you face to face. I was serving a God I heard of, but now that I see you, I realize that I am not righteous. And when Job walked out of his righteousness, God reversed his fortune. Because Job walked in, out of the poverty of his name and into the riches of God's name. Do you see what I mean? So being born again is accepting Jesus one time as Savior, but accepting him as Lord is every day until you die. You've been in situations, those of you that flow in the prophetic, those of you that flow in the Holy Ghost, you know you've been in situations where sometimes the Holy Ghost told you to do something and you're like, well, I don't know if that's the Holy Ghost or I don't know, I don't know if I want to do that. Or the Holy Spirit says, go over there to talk to somebody and you didn't talk to them or the Holy Ghost tells you to pray or something and you didn't do it the first time. Then sometimes you've got to repent and go ask God for forgiveness and say, the Lord told me to come to ministry and I, I didn't do it. You see what I mean? Sometimes God is working with us for years on things like maybe finances. Like maybe you're a Christian and you don't tithe. We're supposed to tithe as Christians, but maybe you don't. God might work with you for years to teach you how to bring your 10% into the house of God. Okay? Maybe it's your diet. God might work with you for years. You might not be able to just pop your fingers and change your diet. You may have to grow to that. Sometimes people, it's their faithful church attendance. Sometimes you didn't grow up coming to church, or sometimes you've been out of church for a while. 
So sometimes God has to work with you to get you back to the point to understand that you need to come to the house of God on a regular basis. Do you see what I mean? So that's what I mean when I say accepting him as Savior is once for all time. Once you save, you can't be unsaved. You are born again. Just like you were born in the natural, you are born in the spirit and you are God's child. And you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and you can't be unsaved. That's not the issue. <laughs> the issue is accepting him as Lord. Doing what the Lord tells you to do. And that's going to be every day for the rest of your life. But, but a lot of critics say, Prophet Taylor, if you preach that, then Christians are going to think that's a license to sin. And I'm saying to myself, I'm saying to you, that is untrue. Because once you know the love of God, you will begin to understand that God's love is expressed in his commandments. So in other words, God is showing you how to win in life when he tells you what to do. When the Lord takes control of your life, he takes you from faith to faith and glory to glory. And he lifts you every year that you live because his love is expressed in his commandments. But under the new covenant, I don't have to try to obey God in my own strength. That's the beauty of grace. Grace doesn't mean I can live any kind of way I want to. Grace means I don't have to serve God in my own strength. That's why we get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's why God gives us grace. In other words, the new covenant written in the blood of Jesus Christ means that God will give you the power to serve him the way he wants you to. There's nothing that God will ask you to do under the new covenant that he won't enable you to do through his grace. That's why it's so beautiful. And if you are still a carnal Christian or your mind isn't renewed or you're not in the word every day or you don't come to church and you're not growing spiritually, what you will discover is that your life will never come into focus. Your life will never be as blessed as it could be. Your life will never come to the fullness that God wants you to have until you get into obedience. The good news under the new covenant is that God will open his hand and give you the grace to be obedient. But you have to have the will. God is not going to make your choices for you. Remember I told you, that's why I work so hard against genie concept. God is not going to make your choices for you. If you know you need to go to the gym, you got to go to the gym. The Holy Ghost will give you the power to go and the power to work out, but you got to go. If you know you need to tithe, you got to write that tithe check. You got to get that 10% cash out and put it in the offering. God will give you the grace, the enablement, but you have to have the will. You have to make the choice. The choice is always yours. God does not take away our power of choice. You see that? But anything that God wants you to do under the new covenant, he will open his hand and enable you to do. That's why grace is so wonderful. And as you begin to know him and know his love, you will discover that he has your best interest at heart. That's what religious people always miss. Religious people are about rules. Don't do this. Do that. Don't do this. Do that. That's how religious people talk. That's not how Jesus talked. Jesus said, um, I keep my father's commandments and remain in his love. One more time. Jesus said, I keep my father's commandments and remain in his love. So in other words, the Lord was saying he knew that father's God, Father God's plan for him was the best plan for him. He knew that Father God's love was expressed in his commandments. And that's why Jesus did what Father God said every day. Because he knew that was the highest life possible for him. You understand? That's what they don't tell you. That's what the religious people don't tell you. They're, they're just about rules. Don't do this and don't do that. No, 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 no. You need to get to know God. And as you get to know God, you will know his personal love for you. And as you learn his personal love for you, you will see that he has always had your best interest at heart. He has always wanted the best for you. The problem is we don't know what's best for us. We by ourselves are sight walkers. So we look at life and we look at things and we look at other people and we look at stuff on TV and we look at the movies and we say, well, I want that. And if you take it before God and God says no, it's because that wouldn't be the best for you. The best for you is always found, number one, in his written word. And number two, uh, it's always found in his uh, rainbow word, his revealed word, his prophetic word. Okay? 
And so what that means is that, for example, uh, what house should I buy, what college should I go to, and what car should I drive is not in the Bible. <laughs> you have to get that from a prophetic or rainbow word from God. God, what city do you want me to live in? The Lord has to show you that prophetically. That's not in the scripture. Lord, what house do you want me to buy? That's not in the scripture. The Lord has to show you that prophetically through the rainbow word. Do you see what I mean? But as you get to know him, as you get to know him, as you get to know him, you will know his love for you. And as you get to know his personal love for you, you will discover that in his commandments is the best life for you. I'm sad to say that so many of us, that takes decades. It doesn't have to. But some of us, it takes decades of living on our own and messing up and making mistakes and being unhappy before we come back and surrender our lives to Christ. And many times that's because nobody told you when you first got saved that God's love for you is expressing his commandments, that the plan he has for your life is actually the best life for you. But that plan is not going to look like what you thought it was going to look like. And that plan is not going to go to where you thought it was going to go. And that plan is not going to be what you thought it was going to be. That's the problem we have, is that we have to learn how to trust him. And to trust the Lord means to deny yourself. To trust the Lord means to crucify your flesh. To trust the Lord means to crucify your self-will and learn how to be Christ's will or Christ-directed. Let the Lord take the will and direct your steps. Do you see what I mean? And that's every day until you die. Every day until you die. Okay? And then the Lord says in, uh, I believe it's John 15, that you can be cast forth as a branch and wither if you don't abide in him. What's that talking about? Does that mean you lose your salvation? No. It means you stop your fellowship with Christ. It means you started to dry up. You've seen that. You started to dry up. You weren't filled with the Holy Ghost anymore. You weren't speaking in tongues. You wouldn't have your prayer time. You wouldn't have your worship time. You weren't doing anything like that. And then your life began to dehydrate. And you weren't spirit-filled. And you weren't walking in the will of God. And next thing you know, you make a mistake. You do like Samson and your life ends up early. Or your life gets consumed by something sinful because you were making sinful choices instead of staying in obedience to Christ. And you can make you can make your choices every day. Okay? So anyway, so I'm saying all that to say that just like you come out of your mother's womb and you're your parents' child, when you come out of the womb of heaven, you are God's child. But to realize the full benefit to become all that you're supposed to be requires not just accepting him as savior. When you come out of your mother's womb, you don't stay a baby. If you stay a baby, we know there's a problem. You're not designed to stay a baby physically. Understand? Well, you're not designed to stay a baby spiritually either, but to grow and become all that you're supposed to be, you have to uh, surrender and let the Lord be your Lord and take your hands off the reel and do what God is telling you to do. Are there Christians that don't do that? Yes. There are Christians that accept him as Savior and never accept him as Lord. They will never become what they're supposed to become in this life, and they will never get the reward of what they're supposed to get in the next life. You see what I mean? But once again, once again, it's getting to know him and getting to know that love. So anyway, so today's word was new grace. So again, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, what the Spirit of God wanted me to focus on in verse uh, 10 was... For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now that we are in a season of new grace, what the Lord wants us to do is pray and ask him. Because remember, I told you last time about getting your assignment for the summer. God wants us to pray and ask him to clear our lives out of anything that's not from him. It's entirely possible that you overcommitted and then maybe even some good things that you are doing are not what the Lord wants you to do maybe right now or, or not at all. 
because you don't always hear this, but you can't do every good thing you might want to do because you don't have enough time. Not because you're not able in terms of the capacity, but because you don't have enough time to tra chase every good work that there is under the sun. So what the Lord wanted me to focus on with this verse and this teaching was, we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So in other words, our prayer, uh, we're in June and our prayer for the summer. Last week I talked about receiving new assignments. This week I'm talking about God help me to be sure that everything I'm doing is in your will. Every good work that you want me to do, help me, God, to be sure that that's what I'm doing. Why is that so important? Because it's the easiest thing in the world to get caught up in a bunch of stuff that you're not supposed to do. It's good stuff and it's good works, but it's not exactly what God wants you to do either in this season or at all. Let me give you some practical examples. You can't be on the usher board and drive the church van and play for the choir and, and play for children's church and serve on the elder board and serve on the trustee board and then help clean up the church every Sunday picking up all the church. You can't do all that. You can't do all that. All that is good stuff and all that stuff needs to be done. But you can't do all that. You can't do all that. So what you have to do is you have to ask God to show you what are the good works that you have ordained for me to do. And don't let yourself get caught up on a path where somebody else is saying, well, you should do this and you should do that. And we need help in children's church. And we need help in this ministry. And we need this. And what about the senior citizens? And what about the military? And what about the veterans? And what about the sick and the shut-in? Blah, 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 blah. There's always so many good works to be done. But you have to ask the Lord. This is like a fine-tuning message. This is like a God, show me what it is you want me to do. And then uh, one of the prophetesses at our church preached this morning about uh, uh, perseverance, such a powerful message. And she talks about perseverance and staying in the will of God no matter what. And she gave her personal testimony about how she knew she was called to prayer and intercession, and she said she had to make a decision to prioritize um, blessings, the music maker. She had to make uh, a decision to prioritize her, uh, her time to put the house of God first. Okay, And she said she was in the house of God doing prayer and intercession before people even knew uh, who she was. So she was giving her personal testimony about perseverance. And so we don't want to be persevering in something that God didn't call us to do. Because then what's going to happen is you're going to get overloaded and you're going to get burnt out. A whole lot of people end up getting burnt out. Then they throw their hands up. They don't want to have nothing to do with the church. They don't, you know, a whole lot of stuff. It's just because you're burnt out because you're trying to do too much. So this message last week was about getting your summer assignments. This message is about fine-tuning. God, don't let me overcommit. God, don't let me get caught up in anything that's not from you. God, don't let me be drawn into a path where I'm trying to do so many things that I'm not effective in any of them. God, show me what the works that you have before ordained that I should do. You see what I mean? That's a fine-tuning message. That's for Christians that are already in the will of God moving forward, but you want to fine-tune because sometimes people come and opportunities come and people ask you to do stuff that you really don't have time to do or it might be out of the core of your anointing. What do I mean by that? I mean that every anointing and grace gift that God gives you has a core to it, to, and the power of God manifests when you're in your core. If you were a teacher, the power of God manifests when you teach. If you sing, the power of God manifests when you sing. If you're good with money, you're good with money year-round. So whatever you're anointed to do, uh, the power of God manifests when you do it. So there are other things that you could do, but it might not be your core anointing. Do you see what I mean? And sometimes we can get caught up in things that aren't at the core of what we're supposed to do. I know I'm supposed to prophesy. See, my anointing is I have a scribe anointing. My anointing is with words. So I prophesy. I teach, I write music, and I write books. Those are all word-based gifts because I have a scribe anointing. That's the core of what I do. Don't ask me to jump out no airplanes. <laughs> I don't jump out airplanes. I don't do that. Don't ask me to swim with the dolphins and be a marine biologist. I don't swim with the dolphins. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That just ain't what I do. <laughs> you see what I mean? So while people might be going on mission trips and they want, might want to jump out of airplanes and they might want to save the animals, that's all good, but that ain't what I do.
<laughs> my anointing is a scribe anointing. Again, words. I prophesy, I teach, I write music, I write books. That's what I'm saying. So whatever the core of your anointing is, stay in that and ask God to fine tune you so that you don't get caught up being pulled away from things that, you know, you're supposed to be doing into things that are still good, but not necessarily what God wants you to do or what God wants you to do at that time. Does that make sense? Because you hear me say it all the time that you want to stay in sync with God. You want to stay in step with God. And one of the easiest things in the world to do is to get ahead of God or lag behind God. You back somewhere in something the Lord did three years ago in 2016, and the Lord is like, I'm in summer 2019, where you at? And you out there trying to reach ahead, trying to do some stuff, and the Lord hasn't brought you into that season yet. You can see it, but it's not time for you to do it. You see what I mean? That's why last week I said, get summer's work done in the summer, so when September hits, you'll be ready for the fall work. But don't try to do September's work now. Do June's work now. Does that make sense? See what I mean? All right, so the new grace that God has for you is to help fine-tune you in the work he's called you to do, to help you get rid of everything that you're carrying that's not, that he doesn't want you to do. It might be good, but it not, might not be what God wants. So we have to fine-tune now and ask the Lord, what exactly do you want me to do and what do you want me to drop? And once God shows you, stay with that. <laughs> Whatever God tells you, uh, June, July, and August, I want you to do this, stay with that. Because other voices, other people, other opportunities are going to come. And they say, you know, we could really use someone of your talents and your gifts over here. But if that's going to pull you away from my God, what God called you to do, you have to say, well, I appreciate that, brother. I appreciate that, sister, but I can't do that. I can't. That, that's not what God has called me to do right now. So I need to stay with what the Lord has called me to do. That's right, new grace for fine-tuning, to be sure that you're not taking on too much at once, that you're not doing things that are not in the core of your anointing, that you are doing the good works that God has already ordained for you to do, for you to walk in them. All right? Amen, and God bless. Now, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen now. I'll be happy to pray, so put your prayer requests up on the screen, and then we're going to go into the next portion. So if you have any prayer requests, uh, put them up there now. Okay? All right. Now, I say it every week, but when you see me close my eyes and start to speak in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost about deliverance, if there are any demons that need to be cast out, about physical healing, if, I need, if we need to speak a word of healing, uh, about finances and any other prophetic words he wants me to release. So that's where we're going now. Okay, I think this happened last week, but uh, Holy Ghost is bringing it up again. A sinus cavity. Somebody's out there, you're struggling with your sinuses. Maybe it's because of the uh, allergy season or the pollen season. Okay, do, do what I'm doing right now. Take your left hand, put it right on your sinus and your nose and say, In the name of Jesus, I command my sinuses to be clear. I command my sinuses to be every whit whole. And I command my sinuses to open right now in Jesus' name. Now take your right hand and put them on your, your lungs, put it, your right hand on your chest. Say, in the name of Jesus, I command my chest to be clear and open and free from any pollen, any allergies. I command clear air passageways. I command my lungs to be every whit whole, and I command my every breath to be full and complete in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, because by his stripes I am healed. Do it just like you saw me do it. Left hand on sinuses, right hand on your lungs. Okay? Okay, the Holy Ghost is saying somebody's having trouble with their left. And command that ear to be whole, command that ear to be 100% whole in the name of Jesus. And expect to see a miracle next time you go to the doctor. And, and, and the doctor will be amazed 
and how your hearing has improved from the miraculous power of God coming through your ear. Okay, I think that's it. So, uh, praise God. Thank you for tuning in. I hope this message has been a blessing to you. Uh, now, uh, several people have asked me about sewing into my ministry. Finally, I got a, a new phone and I got a, a, my updated app. I have Zelle now. So, I'm going to let you know my Zelle address. Uh, I still have set up. I think I'm going to use uh, prophetdavidtaylor at gmail.com. But let me get that set up for sure. And then I'll let you know next time because a lot of people have asked about sewing into my ministry and they want to make it quick and easy so we can do it through Zelle. So let me get that set up and then I will let you know. And I appreciate uh, any contribution. I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate your kind words. I uh, appreciate any financial contribution. God bless you because I want to keep bringing, you know, the word of God. Now, uh, this Thursday is No More Genies because No More Genies ha happens the second Thursday of every month. So be sure to tune in. This Thursday at 7 p.m., we're going to talk about destroying our genie concept of God. We have ma Many times we have magic concepts. We think of God as a great big genie, and all you have to do is like rub the lamp, and the Lord will do what you want. It does not, uh, no, God does not work that way. So I labor very hard to help us get out of genie concept and get back to our concept according to the word of God. Real faith, actual faith, not this. This this magic stuff we made up. Okay, so that's gonna that's gonna be that's my clothes drying. Don't worry. That's gonna be this Thursday at 7 p.m. right here on Facebook Live and Periscope. This Thursday at 7 p.m. The second Thursday of every month, and then I'll be back uh, next Sunday in my regular time, 2:30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the weekly prophetic word. Also, remember you can watch the replay on Facebook Live. You can watch the replay on Periscope and also on my Twitter, PDT S O T C my Twitter, and you can also watch the replay on YouTube, Prophet David Taylor on YouTube, okay? So the way to find me online is always hashtag PDT, hashtag PDT for Prophet David Taylor. I hashtag everything I do with that hashtag, so if you ever want to find me online, just look up that hashtag, and you can find all my ministry materials, all right? Amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you walk in the new grace. I hope you receive that word. I hope you let God fine tune you so that, you know, we, we're not doing anything we shouldn't be doing, but that we're right in the center of God, of the will of God, and that we spend our summer months doing exactly what the Lord wants us to do so that when some temper hits, we're ready for the new thing and we're not wasting time in places we shouldn't be. Okay? God bless you so much, and I'll see you this Thursday. Amen and amen.